Welcome to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, transformative studies in the Word of God. I'm Pastor John Harris, and this is my podcast. Our topic today is on the devil's devices. I bet you've thought about that. How does the devil work? How can he get a hold of you? Can he can he cause you to sin? Can he take you over? How's he working the lost? You know, the Bible has much to say about it. We're going to open up the Word and check it out. Join me over the next few weeks as we open up this study and find out what God's Word has to say about the devil. I'd like to just sort of uh, go through is, is how, how it is that uh, we let ourselves in so that we, get a t- uh, that we can be taken out. What is it that we do that let the devil use us? Before we get to there, I just want to show you a few passages in Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 4. You know, the devil just can't use anybody. He just can't use any believer. A believer that's standing, Satan can't use. But what he does, he uses those that he's entrapped or ensnared or, or caught or captured or deceived. Or, um, scripture calls it a spoiled child, spoiled children. Uh, that is, a, a, an individual has been captured, and he has taken them, and he can use them. And so uh, the, I think myself that Satan gets no greater pleasure than out of taking a believer and taking him to use, to use a believer to take others down. Uh, it's easy for him to motivate and to uh, use unbelievers because he is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It's more difficult. And so I think, you know, sort of it's a, it's the, it's a, it's a game. That's why he uses wiles and tricks in order to, to co- accomplish his purpose and his task. And so before we read our, uh, read our passage, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, Lord, that uh, we might... Uh, uh, take your word in as it is the word of God. We do pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit might open our hearts and our minds to receive it as it is, the word that effectually works in us. Lord God, now we uh, ask you, who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, to take this word and bless our hearts, to uh, encourage us, to strengthen us, to help us, Lord, to stand on this battlefield of life, so we might be able to uh, uh, be effectual workmen, uh, ministers together with you, ambassadors, those things that you have called us to do, Lord. We pray, Lord, we might stand and do those things boldly, knowing whom we serve, and knowing, Lord, that thou art with us. Lord God, we do praise you and thank you for all these things. In Christ Jesus' name, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. First Timothy chapter 4, notice. I'm just going to read a few verses here, and you're going to see some individuals that have been taken down. They've been taken out. First Timothy 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall what? Depart from the faith. How? Well, they gave heed to seducing spirits and doctors of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Nothing seems to matter. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, uh, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Go on down to verse uh, 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things... You know, the, what's going on here. Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up into the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. You, but you, refuse, but refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto what? Godliness. There are some who would depart from the faith. They were taken out. And they, they gave heed to seducing spirits and, and doctrines of devils. Go over to Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. It can happen. It has happened. And don't think it can't happen to you or I, because it can. Second Timothy 1, verse 13. Paul says, the Holy Spirit says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, and in, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, or this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned what? Away from me, of whom is, and he names a couple, uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes. Then individuals have turned away because of being seduced or deceived or, or captured. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Again, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. It says, Study, right? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. Notice that bad doctrine leads to what? Ungodliness, right? Good doctrine, sound doctrine leads to godliness. Verse sixteen or verse seventeen says, "And their word, their word will eat as doth a, can- a cancer, a canker." Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. And if it's not enough that they're taken out, what else happens? 
They overthrow the faith of some. Said they've been used. Okay, they got caught, but then in their in their capture, they were used then to take others out. They've overthrown the faith of some. They destroyed individuals' victory. Destroyed individuals' walk before the Lord. Look on down verse chap, chapter two, verse twenty-four. It says, "And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient." In meekness, instructing those that what? Oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the what? The snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at what? His own will. Who's a person's worst enemy when they're out of the battle, when they're on the ground laying, when they've been captured? Who's their worst enemy? Is it Satan? It's themselves. Verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that what? Oppose themselves. They've been captured either by chapter 2 of Second Timothy is talking about two things. Either air, verse 16, profane and vain babblings. Verse 23, foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing the gender strifes. It's talking about doctrine. You're supposed to study to show thyself to prove unto God a workman that need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So they've either been taken out because they've listened to seducing spirits or doctrines or devils. Or, verse 19 says... Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands assured. Verse 19, 2 Timothy 2. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands assured, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. And that's a good thing. Because not everybody looks like they're the Lord's. It says there, And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, what? Depart from iniquity. Verse, 20, or verse 21 says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, talking about iniquity and, and, and doctrinal issues, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for whose use? The master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Two parts. Two parts. Ensnared, captured, taken out, and then used to hurt others because they've allowed either doctrinal teaching issues to get in the way, to be, to be a hindrance or a block. Or they've, they've listened to doctrines of devils or seducing spirits. Or they've gotten out of the way in a fleshly way. That is, they've gotten involved in the world. Look over in uh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse um, 17. Notice this. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. It says, brethren, you mark those that are they're doing things right. They're, they're, they're teaching the right things. They're, they're, they're following Paul there. Paul says they walk as... We have, you have us as for an example. Mark them. Okay, be followers together of me. And verse 18 says, because there's a reason. For many walk, that is, they live their life, they carry things out. So for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are what? The enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, they didn't start off that way. Okay, they didn't start off that way. What, what, what's an enemy do? What's an enemy do? If you have an enemy, what do they do to you? They send you nice greeting cards and wish you well, right? They work against you. They attack you, right? Well, these, are, these individuals are enemies of the cross of Christ. They didn't start out that way. They're working against things. They're working to take people out. Well, how did it all start? Well, verse 19 sort of says it. It's sort of backwards. It shows their end, and it goes to their beginning. It says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind what? earthly things they get involved in thinking about earthly things what are we supposed to be thinking about heavenly things Colossians 3 verse 1 says what if you then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ setteth on the right hand of God set your affections on things above and not on things in the earth right for your life is hid with God and when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall we also appear with him in glory don't mind earthly things. It starts there. And then what happens is then, if you go backwards from that, putting your mind, starting to dwell upon those things, you can be taken out. And people get taken out, and their end is destruction, and they're enemies, believers, now enemies of the cross of Christ. And Paul says, I tell you that weeping, that's an awful thing, and it happens. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. It gets better. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Dangerous times shall come. Why? Well, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. And we can go on down through. Now you might think, okay, the last days, that's what's going to happen, right? You know what? When Paul wrote that, that's the way the unsaved world was. You know, unbelievers have always been that way. Who's he talking about? In the last days, I mean, he's not talking about what it's like outside the church. He's not talking about what it's like for unsaved, unregenerate man. Because it's always been that way, right? The lost have always been lovers of their own selves. They've always been boasters and covetous, right? That's, that's the issue. That's, that's the it, right? He's talking about in the church. He's talking about believers. In the last days, what's going to happen is people are going to be turned away. What's, it say? what's 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 say? 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. Preach the word. Be in season, out of season. Reprove, rebu rebuke, exhort with long, long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure. What? Sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers with itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. He's talking about in the church. He's talking about believers. He's talking about those that know the Lord. We're in the last days. We're, 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 in, that, we're in that time period. Okay, and we don't know how long it's going to last. We're in the last days because we see it happening. Okay, that's, this, we're not talking about outside the church. We're talking within the church. Men should be lovers of themselves. Well, why, how could that happen? How could they become covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. God says, from such, turn away. So your defense is to turn away from that when you see it. But in the, the thing is, believers will end up that way. Some will. Well, how is it that a person that's standing in this time period can keep themselves from that happening? It, it, how is it that we allow that into our lives, that, that something like could happen? Well, you know what? It's not, a, it's not a big thing. It starts out very small. It's, uh, you know, by the way, we're, we're sealed with God the Holy Spirit. We're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. We're, we're, uh, his shed blood has taken care of all our sin. And we, we have a, a righteous stand before God. From the, uh, the greatest to the least of believers, if you want to categorize it that way. And, I mean, we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. But it's our walk that's important, that's what we're talking about here. And what's our, because our walk and, and what we're doing in this life, God has put us here with a purpose. And we, and we have something to carry out. We're to be ambassadors for Christ. We're to, we're to be involved in the battle. And Satan wants to take you out. And he'll use whatever means possible. It's not a pretty picture. It starts very small. It starts very seemingly insignificant. It's something that we overlook on how we allow ourselves open to be taken down. Uh, you know, Scripture says, a little leaveneth of what? leaveneth the whole lump, right? A little leaveneth, leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. I was thinking about that earlier today. Uh, my daughter, who you know, she, we have a bread maker, and uh, she made a loaf of bread a few weeks ago that never leavened. I mean, it was like a little, it looked like a biscuit, okay? Now, she put the yeast in it, the leaven in it, and everything, but, but something happened. And as we, we made the bread, Steph and I made the bread together, uh, yesterday and did exact same recipe and ours rose just nice and the problem was what she did was she didn't take into account the temperature you had to take into account the temperature of the water and what she did was she used very hot tap water 
Okay? And, the, and it killed the yeast. It killed the leaven. You know what? Adversity and difficulties are what take out the leaven. Hardships and, and, and the things that we respond to what's happening. When we, when we go, you know, tribulation worketh what? Patience, right? It takes out the leaven. Patience works, works what? Tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience, experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. The shed, the, and, the, and the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. See, in order to get rid of the leaven, there's an issue. God allows some things in our life, adversity, and we can respond to it. Well, some people respond differently. But anyways, a little leaven leaveneth up the whole lump. You need to get rid of the leaven. Well, what's a leaven? Well, you know what? It could be a little envy. You know? It could be a little pride. It could be just looking at things the wrong way. You know, uh, thinking that maybe God has a problem with you. You know, you know, something happens, you think, well, why, God, are you doing this to me? That's a wrong focus. Because we're in a day of grace, God's favor, and God's not working against you. A little gossip. A little indulgence to your flesh. A little time with a false teacher. Somebody you know that's just off the edge a little bit, but you hang out with them. A little anger. A little time with the wrong crowd. Before long, you know what? It doesn't seem like it's that bad. You get a little comfortable with it. It becomes, you know, the new norm. And you let your guard down. And next thing you know, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. It starts small. And you have to be aware that's just little. And if you let just a little chink in your armor, a little hole in the armor, you're, you're, you're allowing an opportunity for the adversary to take you out. Well, how is it then that we allow these chinks in our armor? How is it when we, when we can be very much aware of, of these, this little this leaven that might be uh, out there, okay, that maybe it's in our life? Well, there's, I think there's two major issues, and really summarize in one. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. It's a, you know, in the message is titled "Dancing with the Devil." Well, it's, it's talking about just you know, just letting a little, just a little issue, and it can take you down. It, you, you're letting yourself open for attack. Ephesians four verse twelve says, Ephesians four verse twelve, referring to these gifts that God has given pastors and teachers and prophets and evangelists and apostles. It says for the per, per, for the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, it says in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the of knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more what? Children. Tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Children. You know what? Many of us are very much content to remain children. Not to grow up. Um, or, or maybe we believe we've attained a certain level and that's okay. But remaining a child is a va- very dangerous thing. And I'm going I'm to define that for you in a minute. That does not, need mes- does not mean necessarily that you're not studying your Bible. Because you can study your Bible and you can know all doctrines. But you can still be a child. Being a child means that you can be tossed to and fro. And somebody is lying away to deceive and take you down by the sight of men and all those things like that. Go back to Proverbs chapter 2 for a second. Proverbs chapter 2. Yes, I do use the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 2. Just depending upon what I'm teaching. Proverbs 2. Verse 1. There's two aspects to growing up. There's two aspects to being mature and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Perfect man, a mature person. Proverbs 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words, Proverbs 2, 1, and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, notice that, wisdom, and apply thine heart to what? Understanding. Wisdom and understanding. They are different. They're different. It goes on to say that, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for what? 
understanding, knowledge and understanding. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth, cometh knowledge and what? Out of an understanding. He laith up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yea, every, what? Good path. Wisdom and understanding. Wisdom is, is knowing things. It's doctrine. It's what God says. What is understanding? Yeah, you know, God says some things. What's understanding? That's wisdom. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine. There's doctrine. What's that? That's wisdom. Well, what's the next stuff? For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What is that? Well, one of them is the teachings, stuff God says. What's the reproof, the correction for destruction of righteousness? The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works, right? What is the reproof, the correction for the instruction of righteousness? That's, that's how to live, right? To be a perfect, mature person requires not only doctrine, wisdom, but also understanding, which is how to apply that in your life and make it a living reality. Wisdom and understanding. Two parts. And you are a, an, a, an individual as a child if they don't have both. Because you may know all wisdom, but you know what? If you have wisdom, look at 1 Corinthians 13 says. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 13, sorry. The microphone wasn't working right. That's why I said 15. 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13, verse 1. Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, 1 Corinthians 13, 1, and have not what? Charity. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of all prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not what? Charity. I am nothing. See, you need charity. What is charity? It's love, right? And what is love? What's Galatians 5.22 say love is? It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of God's working in your life. So God takes the wisdom. God takes the doctrine. God teaches the, takes the teaching. God the Holy Spirit takes the Word. And He produces something. Go to Colossians 3. I think that's where it's at. Colossians 3. God says he wants us to be, that the, all scriptures give inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteous, that the man of God may be perfect, mature, thoroughly furnished in all good works. Look what Colossians 3 verse 14 says. And above all these things put on charity, which is the what? The bond. The bond of perfectness. It's, if you want to see what the maturity is, it's charity the bond is the is the is the set the glue the demonstration the seal the, the guarantee of perfect of, of maturity and so a, you're a, one as a child I've, I've said to the young people before until you demonstrate love you're a child you know when a child becomes an adult when they really understand their mom and their dad when they really love their mom and dad and understand what they've done that's when they become an adult they, 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 they see that the sacrifice and they see the, the, uh, the, the care that was provided. That's charity. That's love. That's, that's maturity. Until a person begins to manifest the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, and all the other issues which are aspects of love, they're a child. Look at Titus. Titus chapter 1. So when I'm talking about maturity, or when I'm talking about remaining a child, there's two aspects to it. Titus, make it Titus 2 for the sake of time. Titus 2, verse 1. Notice that sound doctrine involves action. Titus 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become, what? 
sound doctrine. That is, the things which become means come to be. These are part of sound doctrine. It comes to be sound doctrine. And and look what it says there. That the aged may be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviors become as holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And go on down through the list. What's verse 11 says? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation, doctrine hath what? Appeared to all men, teaching us action. Right? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should have... Uh, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Two parts. And the issue is, unless we are mature in both aspects, we can be taken down. We're leaving, a, we're leaving a hole. We're remaining a child. And it's a dangerous thing to be a child in this world. Dangerous thing to be a child in this world, the way things are. God says we need to be established, and we need to be rooted and grounded. Okay, Rooted and grounded in the things of the Lord. Not just knowing but taking that knowledge and putting it in action, manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. What happens if you just know and you don't have love? What, 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 what's it like just to have knowledge and to know a lot of things? I think in, in, the, in, in particular in gray circles, those who understand right division, we get very heady where we think we know an awful lot and we were very, sometimes we're very proud to tell other people about it. Okay? You know what? We become critical. Become critical. But see, a critical spirit is something that Satan can use. And a person who's only mature in doctrine, but has not matured in letting that doctrine change them, is still a child. We become very critical. Um, Paul says in Galatians 6, verse 3, uh, well, look there, Galatians 6, verse 3. Well, the Lord's going to slow time down here for me. Galatians 6, verse 3. See, we get a lot of doctrine sometimes we get in this this part of life. It says, For if a man, Galatians 6, verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something, what? What he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Okay? He deceiveth himself. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. As you go there, we'll end with this passage tonight. These are allowing, it's, it's, it's getting, you know, not, not to grow in the other aspects. So let the Word of God uh, convict you and change you. Really enables us to live still as children. And it's a dangerous thing. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. Notice, notice what this whole passage, what's this passage about? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 and 13. It talks about the body, right? And the functions of the body. But you know, it's not about that. It's about how to live. Look what it says, and, and, and how to look, not, not having critical spirits, and not, and not being, well, look what it says. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 says, For as the body is one, our physical body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. I have a lot of parts, so is the body of Christ. It has a lot of parts, a lot of, a lot of uh, makeup. For by one spirit, God the Holy Spirit, are we all baptized in the one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink, into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Look what it says next. Verses 15 through 17. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were smelling, where were hearing? Yeah, if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? What's it talking about? He says, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not an eye. I'm not part of the body. He's talking about people, members of the body. He's talking about envy. I'm not you. You know, I mean, I, I mean in fact, I, I should be you. Okay, because you know, I'm, I'm not a foot, so I'm not part of this body. Okay, I, I, I should really be an eye. Okay, that's it, it, envy. And um, in the body, people use that. In fact, it's, it's one of the issues. And as a child, if we're not grown up, and we don't see things, take the doctrine of what God says, verse 18 says, God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased Pastor Ken. No. God. God has put us in the body where he's placed us. So the issue is he's put you there as a foot or an eye or a hand or whatever it is. And so don't be, don't be envious. Envious is I should be you. 
because you don't deserve it. That's envy. And it'll, it, it's a chink, a little envy. The next part, verses uh, 21 through 24, by the way, verse 19 says, And if they were all one member, where were the body? As, yeah, but there's differences here. Verse 21, or verse 20, uh, verse 20 says, But now are there many members, yet one body. And now you have verse 21, it goes to the other end. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the foot, feet, I have no need of you. Well, that's talking about pride. That is, I don't need you. I am a hand. I'm a head. I'm, a, I'm an eye. I, I have this high position. See, that's, the pride says something like, you should be me. But you can't. You're not good enough. That's pride. And it's out there. And it'll take you down. It'll take us out if we're not careful. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he's something, uh, or he that thinketh himself something when he's nothing, deceiveth himself. It goes on to say here in verse 22, Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. See, we need to get to understand what the real doctrine is. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together. And that's the way we're out of function. Together. Having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism, no division in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another. So that's what the operation should be. But you know what? Envy and pride take it out. Critical spirits take it out. And so we need to grow. That's Having the same care for one for another is charity. It's love. And so we need to mature and grow in that. We'll talk about the end of the world and the flesh and some other issues next time. You've been listening to the High Band with Word podcast, Transformative Studies in the Word of God. I hope you've enjoyed the study. Please subscribe, like, and comment. This podcast is available on many podcast platforms. Just search on the title. Now, until next time, fight the good fight of faith and God's best to you.